George Institute for Global Health. Every year, more than 50,000 Australians suffer what the Institute is now calling a kidney attack. Sudhir Ganesan was looking forward to an exciting August last year. The 42-year-old was about to start a new job in Singapore, but his life became eventful in a much more serious way. He was admitted to hospital suffering a shortness of breath. The prognosis was that my kidneys had shut down because uh, my blood pressure was too high. And apparently my blood pressure had been high for a period of like what, a couple of years, I guess. And I was, I was not aware of it, obviously. And I had no visible or kind of noticeable symptoms. There are often no warning signs. People may lose up to 90% of their kidney function before getting any symptoms. There are 55,000 heart attacks in Australia each year. What most people don't realise is that there are around 50,000 acute kidney attacks, and it is more deadly. We found that the uh, rate of death from uh, following a, an episode of severe acute kidney injury or acute kidney attack was very high, both in the short and the medium term. Kidney attack is a common complication during hospitalisation. Researchers have found that new treatment methods are urgently needed to deal with acute kidney attacks as the current approach is simply not working. Only a third of patients survive more than three years after their initial diagnosis. The next step for researchers is to find out what does work. We desperately need resources and we, we also need pathways uh, as well as obviously new approaches and new treatment and we're hopeful that some of that direction will come out of the research. Acute kidney attack has no definitive treatment. Well thank God for the fact that it's given you another chance and uh, make the most out of it and that's, that's how I'm looking at it. So. Sudhir is one of the lucky ones. His doctors hope that he will be off dialysis within six months. Emma Hannigan, World News Australia. Police have charged five people in Sydney after seizing a haul of methamphetamine worth an estimated $180 million. 183 kilograms of the drug were hidden inside 27 kayaks imported from China. Federal police say the consignment was destined for the streets of Sydney. It's likely, certainly the streets of Sydney would have been the recipient of quite a large percentage of it. Um, and then potentially, depending on who would have ultimately bought it, uh, distributed to other cities in, around the country. A 61-year-old man believed to be the father of a 12-year-old girl married in an illegal ceremony has been arrested in the Hunter Valley. A Muslim cleric who was until recently the imam at the Mayfield Mosque in the area has also been arrested over the illegal union. The girl, who is now 13, was married to a 26-year-old man who remains in custody. The political fallout from Toyota's impending shutdown has continued. Labor's demanded the Treasurer explain comments he made linking union demands with the carmaker's decision to leave Australia. The manufacturer has denied that workers' pay and conditions were the reason for the pulling out. With the budget looming, the Coalition's keeping tight control of the purse strings. The sale of Medibank Private is just one option to boost government coffers. The coalition says it isn't a sure thing, but it's drawn fire for hiring a PR company on the potential sale. I think it is ridiculous that $2,000 a day is being spent to sell something where the public don't even know that it's for sale. Mr Shorten thinks the money should be spent on other matters, like industry assistance. The Treasurer has indicated that wouldn't have helped Toyota stay in Australia. He says the manufacturer was concerned about workers' pay and conditions. Toyota issued a statement refuting that, denying it's ever blamed unions for its departure. That prompted a fiery exchange in question time. Get your facts right, Labor, and maybe you'll understand. Maybe you'll understand that they tried to stay in Australia and it's part of the responsibility. One job lost every three minutes under this government and all this government can do is blame, background and smear. The government says it's investing in skills and training so workers can take on the jobs of the future. We are going to make sure that industry repositions itself. We will supply money for that to happen. They won't be in shipbuilding unless the government brings forward defence projects, according to the Manufacturing Union. It warns that another 3,000 manufacturing jobs are at risk. It's not good enough that this government leaves both the employers and the workers hanging with their uncertainty. 
also uncertain whether or not the government will remove tariffs on foreign car imports once Australia has no more locally produced ones. So you don't just give away uh, tariff reductions without securing improved opportunities yourself. The move could leave the budget with a billion dollar black hole in this time of austerity. Shalala Madura, World News Australia. Serbia's war crimes court has convicted nine former paramilitaries of war crimes against civilians in Kosovo 15 years ago. They were found guilty of the brutal killing of more than 100 ethnic Albanians during the 1998-99 Kosovo War. The nine defendants belong to a Serbian paramilitary unit known as the Jackals. They were accused of raping, robbing and murdering civilians in four western Kosovo villages. Prosecutors described the crimes as the most brutal of the war when forces loyal to Slobodan Milosevic cracked down on separatists in Kosovo. Of the 11 paramilitaries tried for crimes, two were acquitted. Nine were sentenced to jail terms ranging from two to 20 years, including the unit's commander who denied he was a war criminal. Validnog i kvalitetnog dokaza da je izdao bilo kako, bilo kome naređenje da se bilo kako krivično delo, a posebno ne ratni zločin, počini. In the village of Čuska, 41 people were massacred. A survivor says he saw many of his relatives and friends killed. Mu denue, dok mu nam krep mi denue, se nukom, as nukom zime, već je tjačka ne gore krusove. The brutality of Serbia's crackdown led to a NATO intervention and an 11-week campaign of airstrikes. Kosovo declared independence in 2008. Sam Lakin, World News, Australia. Torrential rain in Bolivia is causing widespread flooding. Hundreds of homes in the Loreto municipality, where indigenous communities live, are surrounded by water. The authorities say 42 people have been killed by landslides. In the Amazon region, several rivers have burst their banks. Persistently heavy rain has fallen since November and is forecast to continue for some weeks yet. Brazilian riot police have fired tear gas and rubber bullets at demonstrators in Rio de Janeiro. They were protesting over the police killing of two young men from a favela in the city's west. Immediately after the protests, residents burned equipment being used to build a bus transit line for the World Cup. Creators of a website promoting the Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah deny they're attempting to radicalize young Australians. They've been criticised for using graphic military themed content, <coughs> but insist their objective is to balance mainstream media. The Australian government lists the military wing of Hezbollah as a terrorist organisation. Bullets are fired and people scream. The graphic images, including tributes to martyrs, are backed by music. The Melbourne-based website creator spoke to SBS on the basis that his identity wouldn't be disclosed for fear of sectarian reprisals. Electronic Resistance describes itself as a small group of politically aware individuals. Everything we've talked about on our website is a form of unity and trying to bring people together. It's just the political stance that we promote. Chair of the Zionists Federation, Philip Chester, describes Hezbollah as a force of evil. This is a, looks like a pretty radical uh, website, uh, lauding terrorist activity and terrorist organisations. There's no place for that in Australia. Mr Chester says he fears the site could encourage the recruitment of new Hezbollah fighters. Chair of the Australian Arabic Council, Roland Jabour, says the resistance group plays a legitimate role in Lebanon's government and is unfairly targeted. It's often the case because, uh, you know, we do deal with double standards uh, at a local level and internationally. Any group or individual who um, criticises the State of Israel is immediately silenced and accused of either being a terrorist or anti-Semitic. Electronic Resistance says the material on the site is drawn from other media sources and that it's opposed to violence, in particular the recruitment of young Australians for jihadist activities. I mean, there's a lot of gunshots, there's a lot of stuff like that, but realistically it's not promoting anything. It's not encouraging anyone to go anywhere. 
Middle East analyst Will Plowright says the strong military theme videos indicate otherwise. The presence of these videos suggests that they have some sort of, kind of jihadist leanings or, or that they're providing material which does promote uh, involvement in armed jihad. But Mr Plowright doubts the site alone would serve to recruit terror operatives. The process of uh, radicalization and recruitment into an armed group is usually a long uh, social process, which involves uh, interactions with peers. The Attorney General issued a statement saying the department can't comment on specific cases, but any web material inciting terrorism will be investigated. Luke Waters, World News Australia. The decision by carmakers to leave Australia highlights the structural changes taking place in our economy. Massive changes that Wollongong in New South Wales has already been through, Janice. It has, Anton. The Illawarra south of Sydney didn't have car manufacturing, but heavily relied on coal mining and steel. But those industries faded away, putting pressure on employment. SBS business reporter Ricardo Gonzalez travelled to his hometown to find out how Wollongong is reinventing itself and which North American city is serving as its inspiration. The Australian flag may be up, but only the shell of one of Pacific Brand's old bonds factories in Wollongong remains after it was shut down four years ago. It was pretty sad, actually. At first, I didn't know what I was going to do. But those feelings didn't last long. I um, thought, well, I'm going to go back and study and get my diploma in beauty. Monica now runs her own beauty business. But many in the Illawarra aren't as lucky. Unemployment is greater than the national average. We've had some major hits with manufacturing. One of the region's largest employers, Blue Scope Steel, has been radically downsized over the last 20 years, with thousands of staff, many of them migrants, let go. It gave us a reality check about, uh, about our future employment. These days, the services sector, including health, retail, education and aged care, form 80% of the city's economy. What we need to try and do is get into more knowledge and innovative areas of activity. The University of Wollongong, which generates 8,000 jobs, is playing a key role. We developed a highly, highly um, uh, technology-based university focus on how we re-engineer our manufacturing industry. The tertiary institution pumps out one of the highest number of IT graduates in the country and is trying to retain them. We get these young, young graduates who come out who've got an idea and we give them a building and some people to help them market and we help foster and be become catalysts for their ideas to become small businesses. Wollongong's shift from industrial centre to technology hub has been inspired by the successful transformation of a similar city on the other side of the world. Like Wollongong, the Canadian city of Waterloo shares similar geographic, social and economic characteristics stemming from an industrial past. The development of the University of Waterloo as a technology educator gave birth to a global communications giant. Research in Motion, which is now BlackBerry, which started in about the late 1980s by Mike Lazaridis out of the University of Waterloo. BlackBerry helped build Waterloo as an alternative to Silicon Valley. In turn, it attracted numerous multinational companies requiring highly skilled employees. And while BlackBerry is going through its own restructure, shedding 1,000 positions over several years, those people are expected to start their own ventures or find other work. It's not just tech companies hiring people from BlackBerry. It's, it's the insurance sector, the finance fields. A lot of companies are just thrilled to have access to these highly skilled people. Wollongong is hoping to produce its own big thing, but like Waterloo, will need the private sector to get behind it. If we continue to rely on government funding for everything that we do, then it, we don't become independent. We don't become resilient. We become reliant on external parties that makes us unsustainable. Sustainability, a key theme for what its council calls the city of innovation. Ricardo Gonçalves, World News Australia. And tomorrow, Ricardo will speak with a small business owner who's taken advantage of the bond shutdown in Western Sydney by starting up her own undergarment label.